Power Interwebs, welcome to Let's Build Computers. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a bit of a crash course in poor man's LED lighting for PCs today. Um, so this is basically just a result of some experimentation that I've been doing myself recently. Um, because um, uh, I recently built a new temporary computer for home because my home rig is on its last legs. It's got an old AMD FX8 in it and it's just ugh, horrible, horrible CPU. Anyway, the point is I've got a temporary computer at the moment that's built in uh, um, a NZXT S340. Um, but I've got no lighting in there and personally I love to have some soft illumination in my PCs. Um, so um, I've been looking at some various cheap LED strips to uh, see what would work best and what I want to do in future and just see what's out there basically. Now for cheap LED lighting, um, one thing that I've already tried in the past on the uh, the adamant tower here, I'll just show you what we've got in this in my recording rig. So here in the adamant tower, we have just a cheap RGB LED strip down the side here, and that's plugged in to this tiny little controller here, which in turn is connected to a USB port. And this kit is like I don't know, it's like five five or eight pounds on eBay, something like that. Uh, something along those lines, and it's not bad. It's about, a f it's probably about a 50 or 60 centimetre LED strip, it just goes slightly up the top there. And as you can see, I've just got that zip tied up the top. So it's a nice easy mount, it's not permanently affixed. And that has reasonable colour reproduction. It's got a fairly natural white colour to it at the moment. However, this one has been on for a while. This sits on all the time, this, this rig. So it's yellowed out slightly, which has made it a bit more natural and a bit less cold white. But that's a good thing. Um, however, you know, it's not the brightest thing in the world and what I've been looking at is like one meter long strips to see how well those do. So let's have a look at what I've got lined up on the counter today and I'll just show you what my findings were for that. So firstly, what I've got here is a one meter RGB LED strip. Now the first thing that is worth noting is these RGB LED strips, you can buy it really cheap on eBay, really, really cheap, like uh, five pound probably five, approximately five pounds for a one meter cable like this. You can probably find it cheaper if you buy greater quantities and cut it up. Um, or, you know, you might be able to find it cheaper elsewhere, whatever, just, it's, a, it's about five quid. It's not expensive, which is my point here. Um, now, the other flavor that you, that you can get, now I wasn't aware of this until I recently saw it, but there is also an RGBW flavor, which is um, red, green, blue, and white. And that has a very interesting importance, which I'll cover in a moment. But the point is, this is the four pin connector. So you've got plus, you've got your VCC line and then the RGB negatives. Um, and the, uh, the RGBW one is a five pin um, setup, where again, you've got VCC, an RGB and a white negative as well. Um, so obviously that gives you your red, green, blue and an individual white LED. Um, now, as I mentioned, in the Adamant Tower, we've got a simple controller like this little dude here um, that's running the show, and it's got a 5 volt input, which can come from USB, or in this case, this one I've got here just has a little AA battery pack on it, which I'm not going to use, but I bought it just so I could cut it up and just, again, I could just splice these wires onto a power supply. Uh, but the point is it's 5 volt input, and then it's got a color select button, a speed or brightness select, and a mode button. And by pressing these in various combinations, you can make it do different things. And it will it'll cycle through colors, it will do fade, it will do breathing, uh, or it will just do still colors and so on and so forth. They're not particularly exotic, but it gives you basic control over the LEDs. Now, the other one that I've bought, um, which is a little bit more entertaining, is this controller here. Now, this has got a 12 volt input on it, which is important, which I'll tell you why that's important in a moment. Again, we've got the four pin RGBW, uh, sorry, four pin RGB output, However, this one has a remote control. Uh, oh, that's the small remote control. There we go. I've got two of these remote controls. Don't ask why. Anyway, and this one actually has an infrared remote control that you can uh, that you can control it with. So this is super cool because now this means that I can change my lights from outside the case. All I've got to do is make sure that little IR receiver is just uh, in sh in view somewhere. And now I've got this funky little remote control that I can use to turn the lights on and off at will, which is cool because now I have, you know, a hardware control. So let's light some of these up and I'll show you the pros and cons I've found of the different methods of control. So first thing I'm gonna do is power up this LED strip uh, from the, um, uh, from the uh, USB or the five volt controller. So I've gotta look at this thing. We've got a plus symbol there and there's my plus. So it goes that way around. 
Don't worry if you get these the wrong way around, it just won't light up if you have it the wrong way around. So let's put that in a curl for a sec, just so you can see it. And I'm just gonna wire up my power supply at five volts. All right, so now our LED strip has lit up. However, the first thing that I wanna point out is it's not particularly bright. That is the first thing that I've noticed about this. Now, it's already dazzling the camera, but to be honest, I would wager if I bring that right up to the camera, I, I would imagine that the camera's uh, auto exposure can probably compensate for this. And as you can see there, you can just see the, the RGB filaments in those LEDs. And as you can see from the overall HDR, I mean, this is a HDR camera, which is quite impressive to be honest, but even still, it's not particularly bright. Not very bright. It's not as bright as the one that's already in my computer. So I was kind of disappointed by, um, uh, by this setup. However, again, we can still, we can cycle through colors. So if I um, hit color, nope, uh, what about mode? Speed. Oh, we don't seem to be getting much of anything from this actually. Maybe hold it down. Nope. Well, that's interesting. That one doesn't even seem to be working properly. So yeah, not particularly bright, but I, I mean, I guess this is what you get when you're buying eBay stuff, basically, you know, now and then it's gonna be a bit crap, based in short. So yeah, not a great setup, wasn't too impressed by that. And the biggest thing that's gonna be an issue here is, I mean, for example, even at just that brightness, we're pulling 260 milliamps on the power supply at five volts. And that is more or less, um, that's technically the initial limit on a USB 2 port. Now, obviously you can plug this into like USB 3 uh, and, and high power USB ports and get more out of them. But already we seem to have a huge limitation. Oh, there we go, we have brightness controls. But yeah, we seem to have a big limitation in the maximum brightness level here. Oh, there we go, the color's working now. It's come back to life, but well, there you go. There's the colors in action. So you, you see what's going on there now. It's suddenly decided to work now, whatever. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, you see the issue here. It's not very bright. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug it into this controller instead. Now this is 12 volts and it's rated for up to six amps. That's a lot of, that's a lot of current out of this kind of thing. So let's hook this bad boy up and I'll show you how much brighter this thing is gonna be with a much higher rated power supply on it instead of a piddly little five volt input. So here we go. Right, so we've plugged this in and we're at five volts. So firstly, let's dial this up to the full fat 12 volts. Right, so that's 12 volts. And you should notice that it feels that it's noticeably brighter now. And we're now pulling 500 milliamps. So we're pulling twice the power that we previously were. And now, watch as I dial this up to maximum brightness. Now, using the remote control, I can increase the brightness, and each, each brightness step is 500 milliamps. So now we're at one amp, one and a half amps, two amps, two and a half, three, three and a half, and that's full brightness. So now we're at full tilt, and now you can see that those things are really throwing it out. So that's more like it. However, we're pulling three and a half amps at 12 volts. So obviously that's just gonna, that's just gonna blow up your USB port. So you can't run one of these things off a USB port anymore. We actually need to deliver proper power to it. The other thing as well is that these LEDs are actually heating up. They're warm to the touch now. So I'm actually gonna turn those down because I suspect now at that kind of, at that kind of load, you need to be putting these on some kind of heat sinking surface. You need to stick these to a metal strip or something like that to heat sink it away. At some point, I want to do another experiment where I'll buy one of these strips. I might do it with one of the spare ones I have, because I have another strip here, as you can see, I've got one on a reel. Um, I might do it with this one, where I plug it in, ramp it up to three and a half amps, and just leave it coiled up like this and see how long it lasts for before it burns out. Because it might be that it reaches an equilibrium where it heats up and then stops heating up and it just goes, okay, I'm gonna run at like 50, 50 degrees, but I'm fine with that. 
Uh, or I might find that I come back half an hour later to find that he's died. Um, so, you know, I want to know whether you whether it's okay to burn, sit the LEDs up at high temperature or not. You know, maybe they'll be fine with it. Either way, though, we need to be a little bit careful not to run these at full tilt unless we've actually got some cooling on them. But we can do, that's the point. And in addition to that, so now I've got this funky controller here, uh, I can go ahead and I can go red, or I can go green, or I can go blue, or I can go back to white. And now this brings us back to the RGB versus RGBW part, where if this was RGBW, when I set them to white, we would have just the white LEDs. But at the moment, because we need to use a combination of our red, green, and blue to create the white light, when I set it to white, we're basically driving all three filaments of the LED at full tilt. And that's one of the reasons why this thing seems to use up an obnoxious amount of power um, for seemingly not a lot of light. Because if we do the maths, three and a half times 12 is 36 odd watts. Now to put that in perspective, 36 watts is how much power my bench light is consuming. That's this huge LED baton I've got up here. That's a 240 volt LED baton that illuminates my desk. And that thing is 36 watts and it's 3000 lumens. And I'm pretty certain that LED strip isn't putting out 3000 lumens. Again, to put lumens into perspective, uh, a bog standard um, LED torch, such as you'd find on Amazon or eBay, like this little, one of these affairs that runs on a uh, 18360 or whatever it is, 18650 battery there, that's a 3000 milliamp hour LiPo battery. Uh, this thing is a thousand lumens and creates that much light, which as you can see, you know, that easily overpowers the LEDs even if I turn them back up to full tilt again. So there's no way that this thing is putting out, you know, like a thousand odd lumens, I don't, I don't think anyway. I haven't calculated it, but you get, you get the point. So if we had an RGBW LED strip, we would get probably the same quantity of light using much less power, which is the huge advantage of the RGBW patterns. In addition to that, of course, you get truer color reproduction because you're able to use the white to, uh, uh, to change the brightness of the color um, instead of just simply turning the RG or B up and down. So, um, so this is the setup that I wanna do though. So how do we get this into a PC? Because at the moment I've got this hooked up to a power supply and I'll just show you that setup as well, just for posterity. So there's my DC power supply that's powering this whole show. And as you can see, if I start turning the brightness of the LEDs up again, the current goes up in 500 milliamp steps. And let's take that all the way up to full brightness again. And then yeah, there's our three and a half amp load. And then if I switch that over to just red only, as you can see, the current drastically drops because we're now only driving one of the three filaments in the LED. Incidentally, the green ones use even less power and the blues should be a bit higher, I believe. Oh, that's curious. Apparently the blues use less than reds. Huh. Well, today I learned. It's not much in it, but there it is. Anyway, and then if I switch this onto like uh, one of the uh, the disco modes. So let's go to um, let's go to phase seven and uh, quick. So that's going to sit there and cycle through RGB spectrum now. And as you can see, we get variable current as it goes through the various colors. So. If you have it on the uh, rainbow mode, you're gonna use less power. But as you can see, there is also a little bit of a peak load in there as well. But yeah, so that's that. Right, so as I said, how are we gonna get this into a computer? Because, you know, how do we get that 12 volt power supply into the computer? Let's start studying that. Okay, so my magic box here that I've got powering it has a... Uh, um, has just a bog standard barrel DC jack on it. And uh, just for just for the sake of it, let me just quickly measure that one. I think it's the, uh, that is, so that is 5.4 external millimeters and that's two mil internal diameter. So, uh, so yeah, it's a five and a half external and two mil internal jack. And that's more or less standard for gadgets like this, and it's gonna be a positive center pin because they always are, which is 
probably marked, yeah, that's marked on the label there as well, positive center pin. Um, so incidentally, another thing that I also noticed, initially I had my crocodile clips hooked onto uh, these two tunnels here, because as you can see, this is a nine volt battery snap to a DC jack adapter. And I actually started melting this guy. This little thin wire here, not rated for three and a half amps. It started smoking and everything, and it was all fairly dramatic. So that's why I'd unscrewed this, and I was jumping straight onto the backs of the jack to uh, bypass this wire. So, um, uh, so if we want to use this, we're going to need to have beefier wire on it. So let me show you what I've got planned for that. So here I have a Molex to three pin fan adapter. Now this has also got some extra wires hanging off the end because I use this for hot wiring stuff and that kind of thing. But I'm, I'm gonna destroy this to make a new adapter out of it. And now I know what you're saying, uh, grown Molex, I don't have any of that inside my computer. Um, now, luckily for me, um, because of reasons, I do actually have a Molex chain connected up on the computer that I'm putting this into, so I can use this Molex adapter. However, alternatively, you may need to find yourself um, a, you need a male SATA adapter, I believe. So that would be a Serial ATA, uh, yes, a Serial ATA, the one that would plug into a Serial ATA adapter on your power supply. I, I don't, I, it's really confusing which one is which, because of course, this is the female external, but it has the pins in, which makes that the male socket. I don't know, I can't remember. Anyway, probably should look that up before publishing this video, but I'm not gonna. Anyway, the point is you need to make sure you have got, got the correct adapter. They do exist. If you want to find one, get yourself a Serial ATA to Molex adapter. Um, and then you can cut that up and use the Serial ATA connector to give you this bit, which is what we want, which we can plug into our power supply. So let's cut this thing up. And then what we're going to do is we're going to wire this uh, DC jack onto the 12 volt pins. And as you can see, this has nice beefy high current wire on it because it's designed for a power supply. So, uh, right, let's do some wrecking. We only need 12 volts, which is yellow and a black. So I'm gonna drop out these extra pins as well to get them out the way and reduce the amount of wires. So we'll remove those from the Molex connector. So I'm gonna poke in the little flaps sticking out and then push the pin out. There we go, so far so good. So now we need to strip these wires and we need to retrieve this guy. So uh, we've got to desolder those, strip those and solder those to there. There we go. One Molex to DC jack adapter. Skadoosh. Perfect. Works just fine. All right, so let's get this thing fitted to a PC. Right, so here is the Regent Tower, which is my temporary gaming PC. It's a S340 build with a uh, i7 4770K in it, and my uh, GTX 960. So this is a temporary build uh, while I'm saving up for a new computer. Um, and as you can see, it's a fairly tidy build in here. You know, it's a, it's a nice, simple, straightforward build. Um, so yeah, I just want to add a, just a little bit of pizzazz to it, basically. And you know, it doesn't need it, but it, it'll look cool with it. And also, as I say, it's an experiment, just so when I build my nice computer, in a few months, well, I don't know when it's gonna be, whenever I've got money, I guess. Um, yeah, when I build my nice computer, I'll know exactly what LED lighting I'm gonna put in there. Now, this LED strip being a meter long is very long, so um, we can actually put this all the way around the computer, and that means that that low brightness probably won't be much of an issue, and it also means that we're gonna have no shadows in this thing at all. 
So I'm kind of thinking of going around the outside like this. Um, and then maybe along the bottom there. But the problem is that's going to make these LEDs visible. And I don't want the LEDs to be visible because um, LEDs have an awful lot of glare to them. Um, and I'll be able to see those through the window, which will annoy me. So maybe that's not the best way. Um, one meter is kind of too long, to be honest. I think, like, let me see. What's half a meter? So half a meter is that long, which is sort of one side plus a little bit. What you really want is like 60 centimeters, I think. How long do I reckon 60 centimeters will be? Well, it'll be about a third. So if we go to two thirds, which is approximately that much, that would do about two sides or so. So yeah, about 60 or 70 centimeters, I think would be the perfect length to get as many LEDs in there as possible without having the strip on show. Now, if I want to, the cool thing about these LED strips is, let me just go in for the close shot. The cool thing about these LED strips is they have these periodic bridges in them. As you can see, it's two LEDs and then a bridge. Two LEDs, bridge. So you can cut the strip at any place where those uh, copper bridges are and cut the strip to whatever length you want it to be. And that will not affect how it operates. You have two LEDs and then you can see the low, you can see the current balance resistors in there for those two LEDs. So you can cut these things down to whatever size you want, uh, as long as you, you know, obviously don't cut it in the middle of an LED kind of thing. So if I wanted to, I could cut this strip and a part of me wants to do that, but just to play it safe, I'm not going to. I'm going to try and tuck the excess out of sight. So what I think I'm gonna do, I'm gonna be a bit brave here and I'm gonna pull off the backing strip of this LED. So we're sticking for real here, which is something I very rarely do with LED strips. I like to keep my options open, but you know, they're not expensive. I can always get another one. So let's, let's go serial here. And I'm just gonna pin it along the top. Let me just show you what I'm doing. Okay, and now I'm gonna cut the backing because there's nowhere for me to really stick it along the front. So I'm going to cut this bit and pull that off. So we're preserving the sticky back there. And now I'm just gonna go down the front of the case here. Now, is there anywhere I can tuck that in? Not really. See, there's a, there is a gap there. However, it's punctured by the front panel points. So I'm gonna go down the front of there, but again, we're not sticking down at this point. And finally, we get to the bottom of the case where it will start coming into view. And my ace in the hole here is what I'm gonna try and do is see if I can just thread it into those vents there. If I go just behind them, duck behind the radiator. Uh, I don't think that's gonna work. I might have to go in there. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. I'm making this up. Then if I pull that, th uh, no, that's not gonna work. I suppose I could go down, see, I could go along there and then duck into there. But again, we're gonna have visible LED LEDs there. Or I have just spotted this bit up here. Maybe we could, but that's gonna twist it all sideways. I think I can actually drop down that little gap there. Much easier, much easier. Now I think, I think we're gonna need the front panel off to be able to catch that on the other side. There we go. So now that note goes really smoothly down the front of the case. And then I want to curl that back in again somewhere. So let's go in there. And that's gonna come out underneath the hard drive bay.
and there's the end of it there. So now we've just got to hook up the controller to that. So firstly, I'm going to uh, hastily stuff my SSD and data drive back in here. Ahem, please ignore the man behind the curtain. I mock other people for doing this, but it's a temporary computer. Okay, now we need to plug in that dude. And I'm being careful to keep this IR receiver on hand. I'm just going to poke that up there. And I'm just going to zip tie that onto the back of the case to make sure that the sensor side of it stays visible through the window. And then my remote control will work. And once again, I'm aware that this is a hilariously ghetto mount. But this video isn't about show quality LED lighting. I'm just showing you what is possible for like less than 10 pounds, basically. What you can do without spending big bucks. If you want show quality lighting, then just buy NZXTQ. It's expensive, but it's worth every penny. However, I have spent a fraction of the amount and I will also have cool remote control lighting. Even if it is about 16 colors instead of 16 million. Where's my Molex connector? So the Molex connector was here because of a disgusting uh, graphics card adapter I was using at one point, which thankfully is not in there anymore. God damn, I hate Molex connectors. On my next build, this will get done with SATA connectors. Just not today. This is supposed to be a super quick end of the day job. There we go. And I'll just stuff that in there. Let's see if it works. Okay, so here's the computer in situ where I use it at home at the end of my desk. And I've got the lights just on their default white setting at the moment. Now, the interesting thing is, um, it's currently daylight. I mean, it's slightly dim in this room, but it's blazing sunshine outside. So there's a lot of ambient light. And I've got those LEDs on minimum brightness at the moment, which while they were in the shop, I was saying, oh, that's very dim. That's not going to do anything. So first thing I want to point out is that the little USB 5 volt powered version of this probably to totally adequate. Um, you know, absolutely fine, I would say. I kind of regret uh, slating that as much as I did because they would actually be absolutely fine. Um, but yeah, just for the record, here's what happens if we start turning up the brightness. So let's go to up. And if I go up and up and up all the way to full, as you can see, it actually gets pretty bright in there. That's full brightness now. And uh, as you can see, that's starting to um, overpower the camera slightly. Let's bring that back down. So it's changing the brightness of the LEDs via PWM and I can tell that because you can see a slight strobing on the camera and also if you look at the fan at the back of the case you can see a, a stroboscopic effect on that. If I turn those back up to full tilt again so there's no that's now a full duty cycle um, the strobing on the camera has actually stopped now. There's a little bit of on the fan just because of uh, rolling shutter but you know you get the idea. So let's turn that back down again. So I found what sort of one notch up from minimum seems to be the sweet spot. So uh, in other news, so yeah, I can use the remote now and I can just go, uh, I can go red, green or blue. And uh, just for the sake of demonstration, if I stick that on the fade seven, so we've just gone to rainbow mode. As you can see, it's actually pretty decent. And last night it looked fantastic while it was in the dark and it's still completely visible during the day. So I'm really chuffed with how this has come out. Um, this, you know, the overall lighting looks really good. It's really even. We've got a shadow under the graphics card, but I'm not too fussed about that, to be honest, because there's nothing down there that I want to illuminate anyway. I've actually got a micro ATX board in this case at the moment. So that's kind of a bit of a void that I want to leave in the shadow, which is why I've got the graphics card low mounted in this case to try and cover up the bottom a bit. 
Um, so yeah, there's that. And um, uh, if I if we stick it back on um, uh, if we stick it back on just white for a moment, we go back to the previous setting. And then the other thing I've got on this controller as well, we've um, so we've got the uh, the jump three and jump seven. So that's just flash between three colors or seven colors. So as you can see, it's just stepping, and then the fade fades between them. So you've got either three color or seven color. Then um, let's go to fade seven. And what happens? What, what, what happens if we do flash? Okay, so that goes off and on. Oh, that's literally just flash on the current color. What about auto? What does that do? Hmm. I think auto. I think auto is going to go through all of the modes. I think it's going to do flash three, flash seven, then fade three, fade seven. Yeah, that's what it's doing. So auto just goes through all of the modes. So it's like a demo mode basically. And then also I can go to fade seven and I can do uh, quick to do it quickly, or I can go slow and it will very slowly fade through the colors as well. Um, and then finally, we've got these DIY buttons, um, which are presets. So for example, if we go to DIY three, uh, let's just dial in that to, um, uh, let's just take all the red out. So I'll, I'll minus all the red out of that. Uh, so the controller is not very high quality. There we go. So we've got a we've got a teal color now, um, and um, so that's now programmed into three. So if we go to um, let's go to green, and then if I click on DIY three, it will go back to that preset. And so on DIY one, I've put in this uh, slightly natural white preset, which looks a little red on camera, but in real life, this natural white tone actually matches the case a lot better. It's a little dim in this lighting, but in the dark, that just gives a nice soft illumination which is what I'm going to be leaving it on. But you know, if you wanted to do demonstration mode, I can just go black white and then just go black high brightness, which I'm not going to do because you know, I don't really want to draw 36 watts off of my LED lighting. And then, you know, you've got all these preset colors as well. So we can go to um, you know, we can go to cyan, uh, light green, uh, yellow. Um, some of these ones are not particularly accurate, you know, the orange, that's apparently orange, which is Let's turn the brightness up and see if that's any effective when it's brighter. It's not really particularly orange to the naked eye. That's more yellow, if anything. Uh, ironically, the camera is looking fairly orange, but uh, whatever. Um, so yeah, the color accuracy isn't particularly good. Um, so uh, and this is this brings me around to my final point in that uh, you know matching this lighting versus fancy lighting like NZXT Hue. Now the NZXT lighting when you dial in orange. On, on an NZXT Hue setup, you're going to get orange. You will get actual orange. Um, and in addition to that, on a Hue setup, all of the LEDs on your light strip and on your fans and so on are individually addressable, which means you can do marquee effects and stuff like that. So that's what you're paying for with the expensive lighting setups. But as you can see, for a kit that cost me approximately 10 pounds or so, if I go back to my natural white, it works, and I've got this funky controller as a party trick that I can just leave under the computer. And I don't know, I'm I'm happy with that. You know, I'm not going to pretend that it's as good as the NZXT setups. It really isn't. However, uh, as a as a cheap temporary, well, as a cheap setup, it's just fine. And I'll probably do something similar in my next build, just because it's cheap, basically. So I hope you guys found that interesting. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you all next time. Goodbye for now.